And we're live. Welcome back to my show, everyone. I've got uh, an old friend of mine here. Everybody should know him because he's been um, on various different uh, shows on the internet, but a lot on uh, Reason and Theology in the past, as I have I was also a participant in that show. But for those who don't know, which I'm sure is the minority of viewers, this is uh, Father Patrick. His name is uh, John Ramsey, but his religious name is Father Patrick. He was born in 1970 in New Zealand. He attended University of Waikato in Hamilton, New Zealand, completing a bachelor's degree in science, majoring in mathematics, and in law with honors. He then completed a Master of Theology in Orthodox Studies at the University of Wales. In 2010, followed by a Ph.D., in Orthodox Ecclesiology and 215 at the University of Winchester, England. He presently works as a distance tutor for the Institute of Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge, England. He serves as a priest in the Western Rite Deanery in the UK under the Russian Church outside of Russia. He has enjoyed engaging on Facebook discussions for a number of years after contributing to Orthodox blogs before this. So he is a very prestigious guest and uh, a longtime friend. We've dialogued quite a bit online. So welcome, Father. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, one update by which I forgot to get to yeah. you. I, I'm now under the anti Patriarch of Antioch. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah not minor adjustment. Like that. But that, that's yep. all right. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's <laughs> one good. of those updates which some people miss every now and again, including myself. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. But uh, everything else is, is uh, good. Yeah, you also have some... Uh, He's also written some books, um, which I will uh, link in the show notes after the show's up. He's written a book on the um, on the minor orders of the clergy, and he's written a book on the uh, on ecclesiology. What he he you know what he did his uh, dissertation on. So um, I'll put the links to that. So today um, we are going to be having a dialogue on the filioque. You don't see a lot of dialogue on this nowadays because um, it's just such a difficult subject. But we've got um, basically an eight-part structure to what we intend to do, but it's probably going to be um, very free-flowing. Um, there are some things that I'll try to read off. I've got some notes that I'll read off of, but feel free to interject uh, when you want. Um, so... I'm going to open up first uh, with uh, a definition of the filioque doctrine. But before I do that, um, for my listeners who are not anywhere near being able to study this with any kind of, uh, you know, scholarly depth, um, I wrote a book on the doc on, on the filioque. This is the hardcover book. It's the second edition um, but it's the same content. Um, so no content was changed. I just, it just went from paperback to only hardback. Um, but, uh, this, I try to take people through the basics and the foundations of the doctrine of the filioque, um, obviously from a Catholic perspective, uh, but I do try to engage with the contemporary Orthodox, uh, positions as, as, as best as I know. Um, so let's go on to the first part, which is the definition of the filioque. I'll try to define it. And then, uh, Father Patrick, you tell me if we're working with the same definition. All right. Filioque is Latin for and the son. What is meant by and the son? The Council of Florence states, the Holy Spirit is eternally from the father and the son. He, he has his nature and subsistence at once, simultaneously, from the Father and the Son. He proceeds eternally from both as from one principle and one spiration. The Orthodox churches of the Greek East, on the contrary, teach that the Spirit is eternally from the Father alone, and that his nature and subsistence is from the Father alone, in terms of his hypostatic origin. This is by means of proceeding from the Father. The Latin clause, filioque, was gradually admitted into the Latin liturgy between the 8th and the 11th centuries. 
the introduction of the filioque into the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed by the Latin liturgy constitutes, moreover, a point of disagreement with the Orthodox churches, even to this day. In our dialogue here today, we wish mainly to focus on the doctrinal foundation of the filioque, whether it is orthodox or heterodox, and perhaps if there is a way to bridge the Catholic view and the orthodox view. What do you say, Father? I think that pretty much covers it. Um, the, yeah, I agree. The, the filioque doctrine, as held now, is quite clearly defined in the Council of Florence, as you read out. Um, and so, yes, that's in place. And I think a contrawise to that, the orthodox position is um, clear. I could, um, on the moment, I'll just grab. Yeah, yeah feel free to add there. anything you'd like. Um, yes, wait a second. Theological, yeah. So, but orthodox um, position. Yes. Yeah, so, actually, shall I go in a bit more into a little bit more in depth at the moment on the orthodox position? And I think yeah, I'm yeah. Really yeah, we yeah, could just so move I, right I into the second part, which is exactly that. What is what is the what is the orthodox position? Yeah, I think St. John of Damascus sets this out quite well. Uh, is a, I'll just read a few, uh, four or five quotes here from him yep. that I think help to establish it. Um, so the first one, with me, moreover, the word must also possess spirit. Um, for to conceive of a spirit that dwells in God, we must contemplate it as an essential power existing in its own proper and peculiar subsistence, proceeding from the Father and resting in the word. That's, that's quite a key sense of the orthodox understanding. It's a proceeding from the Father and resting in the word and showing forth the word, neither capable of the disjunction from the God in whom it dwells and the word whose companion it is, nor poured forth to vanish into nothingness. I'll come back to that little bit later as, a, as part of a critique. Um, but being in substance, assistance in the likeness of the word, endowed with life, free of issue, free volition, independent movement, energy, ever willing that which is good and having power to keep pace with the will and all its de decrees, having no beginning, no end, for never was a father at any time lacking the word, nor the word in the spirit. And then it's sort of a father alone is ingenerate, no other subsistence having been give, given him being, the son also alone is generate, for he is big, Gotten of a father's essence without beginning and without time, and only the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father's essence, not having been generated but simply proceeding. And this is a doctrine of the Holy Scripture. Uh, I mention this point because uh, Orthodox, um, it's very clear to distinguish between generation and procession. And quite often we hear Roman Catholics sort of talking in almost vague terms of generation applying to both or, or proceeding or applying to both. Now, there's a certain level where Orthodox would agree with that a little bit, but we are more careful about the specific word you use. We, we consider them as quite distinct from each other. Um, likewise, also, another quote from him, likewise, we also believe in the whole, one Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and rests in the Son. Again, he's repeating that. Further, the generation of the Son from the Father and the procession of the Holy Spirit are simultaneous. So that's another um, important orthodox point. Um, and another point is that there there is one God, his word and spirit. Um, I mentioned that because that, that, that sort of ties into the monarchy of the Father, which we'll discuss a bit more later. Um, but it's important to conceive of it as verily there is one God, his word and spirit. Um, further, and the next not quite further, it would be to understand that we do not speak of a father as derived from anyone, but we speak of him as the father of the son, and we do not speak of a son as cause or father, but we speak of him both as from the father and as the son of a father, and we speak likewise of the Holy Spirit as from the father and call him the spirit of the father, and we do not speak of a spirit as from the son, but we call him the spirit of the son. For if anyone have not the spirit of Christ, he have none of his, said the divine apostle. And we confess that he is manifest and imparted to us through the son, for he breathed on his disciples, he says, and it said, receive the Holy Spirit. So that quote um, is that we, um, the orthodox position is that the spirit is not from the, the, the son, um, but 
where you simply say of the sun. But we, when we talk about, and we'll discuss this later on, um, through the sun, um, this is not in contradiction to that, or, or um, so that through the sun doesn't mean and this, from the sun. Um, and the through the sun is more about the economy. But so I'll just leave it hanging for a moment. We'll come back to that later. But and then at last quote is all the terms then that are appropriate to the father as cause, source, begetter are ascribed to the father alone. The, while those that are appropriate to the, to the caused, begotten son, word, immediate power, will, wisdom are to be ascribed to the son. And those that are appropriate to the cause, processional, manifesting, perfecting power are to be ascribed to the Holy Spirit. The Father is a source and cause of the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son uh, alone and producer of the Holy Spirit. The Son is Son, Word, Wisdom, Power, Image, Effulgence, and Press of the Father and derived from the Father. But the Holy Spirit is not the Son of a Father, but the Spirit of a Father is proceeding from the Father. There is no impulse without Spirit. And we speak also of the Spirit of the Son, not as through though proceeding from him, but is proceeding through him from the Father. For the Father alone is cause. So we see here, and um, it's quite clear that the, the Father alone is the cause uh, regarding um, both of the Son and the Spirit. And though we do reckon, he does talk about through, which again, we'll, we'll expand on later. So I just thought I'd bring that up. So that the key part is procession from the Father um, and uh, the rest in, in the Son. And we all there also is a, a, a mention of through the sun, and um, the, but it's quite clear that that's not from the sun. So that that's basically the author position, which is the position of Saint Saint Photius the Great, and and others like that. The, the, where is some sort of issue in Orthodox theology is what is meant by through, and we'll bring all that out <laughs> a little bit later. Yeah, that's great. So. Um... That was clear. Feel free to uh, add anything if you're comfortable. Um, if you're comfortable, me asking a question within this second part, um, let me know. But if you want to add anything, please feel free. No, well, uh, that's, that's, I think that's okay, it, cool. um, sort of put that yeah. the main part of it down. Okay, cool. So the one question I have in the second part here is just that um, today, um, you know, it seems like in the last. 60 years and i don't want to pretend like i've been reading this for 60 years i've only been reading this for perhaps 10 years now but um it looks like all the publications that i'm reading that the majority of the orthodox readers or, or scholars and I, here i'm talking like father john meyendorf uh father alexander uh Schmeyman, um all the way up to guys like uh, uh marcus plested um, who teaches at Marquette? These are you know Orthodox guys. They would say that what you're describing there, where through the sun, is um, an energetic procession. Could you say? Could you speak to to what it this is when the Orthodox talk about an energetic procession? Uh, because the listeners. They may be hearing one thing from one side of the internet, another thing from the other side. Um, I know you've done a tremendous amount of work in this area, so uh, please settle the uh, settle the case for us here. <laughs> well, unfortunately, not being the patriarchal constant in April or actually an ecumenical synod of myself, unfortunately, I'm not able to settle this particular point, but just add another view to YouTube it. Council, <laughs> the YouTube Council. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, my opinion is um, such that, and I, and I, um, I think someone else on our on the filia quote made a link to the, an article saying similar, is that I, I talk about this through as in reference to the epistasis of um, of this Holy Spirit. I, by the way, I, I do speak of epistasis rather than person because an English word person has a whole lot of psychological connotations and stuff which can get very confusing when talking about the holy spirit so i talk about epistasis as meaning one of the three persons as is commonly used of the holy trinity but i use the greek word epistasis um to def, um just make that point rather than um 
um, the, the word English word person because it, it gets really confusing. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Well, so hypostasis, we un, we'll take that as what uh, the you're talking about the distinctive property and and the individual um, uh, of each of the Trinity, the, the, each member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Father, the Son, uh, three hypostases. Yeah. Um, so I'm taking the through as applicable to the hypostasis and not to just simply the energies. Uh, I think this is these are, these are two completely dis distinct issues, um, and so when we're talking about the Holy Spirit proceeding, we are talking about um, him as an epostasis, and each epostasis is essence and energies as such. Um, so he only proceeds, he proceeds as essence and the energies as as one epostasis. <laughs> um, the distinction of essence is, is, is a diff is a as just a difference between what I am and what I do. <laughs> and so that's uh, the father and the son and the Holy Spirit all do and um, are the same thing and do the same thing. Um, and so it's not just the spirit doesn't proceed just by by activity of him going ac across his activities somehow go through the sun. Um, uh, we're, we're talking about procession through the sun. We're talking about the epistasis of the, of, 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 the, of the Holy Spirit. Um, however, there is a case where when we talk about the Holy Spirit resting in humanity, being given to us, being within our heart, we don't experience the Holy Spirit personally by according to his essence. We can't know the essence. We experience and participate in the Holy Spirit according to his activities, his love, his kindness, his goodness, his gentleness, his, his miraculous powers, etc. We, we, we participate in those. We don't. So this is where I think it's so, so, Gregory Palamas, for example, would make the distinction between essence essences and, and talk about the, us receiving the energies of the spirit in a sense is that we're not engaging the spirit as his essence, though he rests in us truly as epistasis, but our experience of that is, is according to his activities in us, not, not according to his essence as such within us. Right. Um, so that's how I said. So for as far as this the, the filioque, I, I put the essence energies out of the Apart, I think it's a distinct discussion, uh, and that's uh, um, that rule pertains to understanding the sense of God creating through the Son and the, and the Holy Spirit, and some of these other things of the act, act God's how act God's activities work um, in relation to us, um, but but not through the eternal being and 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 for importantly, from my perspective, the manner of existence of each epistasis um which is which is we are just talking about epistasis so through it's talking about a manner of existence of the holy spirit and as far as i'm concerned and i think that other article i read was pretty much came to the same point that's what he was actually talking about it is a manner of existence of of a epistasis of the holy spirit so it is applies to the spirit as epistasis and not just his energies or his activities okay so so would you say then that um when, 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 if an Orthodox person or if any person really um, is talking about the eternal energetic procession of the Holy Spirit, um, that's, that's not, you don't think that John of Damascus is talking about that when he says that the Holy Spirit uh, is, it proceeds from the Father through the Son in this resting. Yeah, no. No, I don't think so. I think that, that any discussion of energetic procession is um, in a manner of economy and, and a relationship of the Holy Spirit to us, uh, in a sense. And so, in, in other words, we engage with the Holy Spirit, we receive the Holy Spirit, the activities of God um, through the Son in the Holy, uh, completed in the Holy Spirit. So, and it's, it's, we, we know God through the Son, <laughs> and uh, um, we come to God through the Son. So every activity comes from the Son, including the reception of the Spirit is through the Son. So our, our entire engagement of God is always through the Son, in, both in terms of the Father and of the Holy Spirit, and in both directions. Thank you. That that does confirm a lot. Uh, most of the scholars that I'm reading, most of the most of the. Uh, scholars on Maximus and Palamas that I've read um, that I document in my book as well um, they they do talk about the the energetic uh, the procession according to energy being the common 
activity of God, which we experience, you know, in the in the economic, uh, you know, experience of God coming to the knowledge of God. So that helps. But I, I wanted to be clear that, you know, you're distinguishing that as one thing. Whereas the descriptions you gave from John of Damascus on the Holy Spirit having his cause in the Father, but that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son and rests in the Son, that is not an uh, a ca- that is not categorically some unique energetic procession. No. You're talking about something a uh, hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit. Um, that is not shared by the Son and the Father. Yes, yes. And, and I'd like to talk about, rather than property, um, manner of existence. Though manner of we existence. can use property, but again, I, I, it's the idea of somebody, I, when I think of property myself personally, I think I've got a property, I've got a certain height or a certain um, um, thing, whereas manner of existence is a way I exist. Um, and so it pertains to ha- how do I in what way do I exist rather than whether I'm, which is something you can say a height is a way I exist. I exist as a height. Right. But it, it's sort of like a little, yeah, it's just a distinction which I find yeah. useful, um, but it's hard to define it. And it, both words are correct, but yeah, I yeah, do that's, like emphasizing manner of existence or mode of existence. That's very helpful because, um, uh, you know, you know, Facebook is a free, it's basically a free publishing outfit. You know, people can broadcast their views. And um, you do have some Orthodox uh, speaking about, so they read the Orthodox perspective on the procession of the Holy Spirit through the Son, um, uh, you know, to who you, um, or, you know, through the Son as an energetic procession but that being a common element uh you're you're trying to take an interpretation where through the sun is really a a unique manner of existence of the holy spirit and not something shared by the father and the son which i think is extremely helpful because the the other way i I think it just kind of because it, 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 it appeals to something common in an effort to describe something unique because the energy is common, you know? Um, so I think that's extremely helpful. The other thing I'd like to ask you is, um, do you think that Photius in his mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, uh, Gregory, the second of Cyprus in his, uh, in his, 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 uh, his works on the, procession that was put into the the Thomas of uh, the Council of Blacker in A1285 and Gregory of Palamas are all saying the same thing when it comes to the spirit's origin and this manner of existence through the sun. Do you think they're all pretty much saying the same thing? Yeah, in my opinion, they are. All, I know some, I haven't read some Gregory uh, Gregory of Cyprus and, and under sufficient depth to speak, but but I know St. Gregory Palamas is very much that this the script sits only from the f- father. Um, and I know that St. Fotius obviously is, does that. Now, St. Fotius, um, where you get the distinctions that we're using through um, St. Gregory, um, Gregory of Cyprus, sort of will talk about through and, and, and the Council of Black and I talk about, but they do it in a very limited sense, uh, in a sense of manifestation. Um, so that's consistent with Photius. So Photius talks, doesn't like it, but he only doesn't like it if you're taking it to mean what the Roman Catholics or what Florence has taken it. It's to mean the same as from, from the sun. It's right. as soon as you take it as an instrument or something where, where it becomes effectively equivalent to from the sun, then um, St. Photius is um, opposing that idea. Um, but he doesn't directly talk about St. John of Damascus, whom he must have known in, in, in his opinion, um, because he, he knew all the works, <laughs> these guys, he, um, that he wasn't speaking against that sense of through which St. John of Damascus uh, was raising. And I think this, the interpretation of um, Black and I is possibly, probably helpful for that, and I think St. Gregory Palamas would, would have gone happily along with, with that as as well so um 
Yeah. yeah. Could you could you speak to manifestation? Because that's another thing that um, it's another word that, uh, you know, some new converts to Orthodox, they 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 hear about this and they they talk about it. But it's not always very carefully defined by somebody as careful as you. Could you could you explain that real quick? So when when they talk about eternal manifestation um, of the Holy Spirit, is that an energetic thing, or is that a or is that a unique hypostasis thing? Let you you let me know. Yeah, um, again, I, I I refer to the hypostasis rather than to the um, to any energetic um, manifestation. And such again, I, I don't quite see where that how that fits into the situation um, there. Um, yeah, so we in and I mean in economy we, we have this manifestation, but there it's interesting. Well, what do you mean by manifestation in an eternal sense? And I suppose the way to speak, think about this is is I find the most useful. Though I'm, I don't restrict this to being the end goal, but I think a number of fathers speak in this way: is God knowing Himself generates His Son. The Son is the image of God as, as a consequence of Him. His the mind knowing itself and and to, to a knowledge uh, requires an image of oneself. You, you don't know something if you don't have an image. There's no point in me talking about I know you and I turn around and, I, and I've forgotten you. <laughs> the knowledge has to stay in my head <laughs> so that if I stop looking at the object, then I I, I, I continue to know it. It's, it's, so there's, that means there's an image distinct from the object which you're knowing to, to say that you know something. And so when the father knows himself he, he must generate an image but of course being god the image is absolutely perfectly himself it's not like us as some sort of vague mental <laughs> idea <laughs> he because he's actually simple and pure he, he generates himself so he actually effectively gives birth to a son which <laughs> um, the, um it's the best closest thing we can say for our own things because there's an, another hypostasis <laughs> that is completely right. thinking loving <laughs> as well um generated from that now god knows himself through the son he's knowing himself god is knowing the father is knowing himself through the son the image is of the father therefore when the father knows himself that he has a spirit is also known through the son so though so when we talk about manifestation the manifestation the knowledge of the spirit of that god has of himself is through the son so all his knowledge of himself is through his own image of himself therefore he knows the spirit through the son and therefore the spirit is in the son as it is in himself uh, uh, um so that's how i understand manifestation that it comes back to the cycle of god knowing himself through the son and that in the complete sense and therefore even he knows the spirit through the son um so the spirit in that sense is manifest through the son yeah that's very helpful because um because I also think that, um, like when Gregory of Cyprus, who I also have not read, I, I've only read um, secondary literature, um, and uh, you know, one of the chief pieces was uh, Aristides Papadakis, the uh, the uh, the controversy on the filioque. Um, I think it's called the Byzantine controversy. I can't remember, but it's been so long. Uh, but in that book. I don't think Gregory of Cyprus, when he talks about the eternal shining or the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit, that he's talking about the a common, active, energetic thing where all the, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are equally involved. I think what you're saying is 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 seems sounds more accurate to me that it's it it is something that is the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit. Um, is it's unique to him, uh, but then your explanation also does answer the question: manifesting to whom? And you know, obviously, there's a counter. There's a part where God is manifested to humanity, but you're talking about the eternal manifestation as something where it's just like the sun is a self knowledge of the word or, or um, of the mind, like the Father having the thought. You know, He knows the Son, the perfect image of Himself. Well, also knowing he has a spirit th is through the sun. Um, that's also a manifestation that's eternal, but there's something unique to the spirit there. 
So I think that really helps. I just wanted to get a really, you know, somebody who's learned it on this issue to define that because these things don't always get clear in the literature. Yeah, well, and this also points out another thing I think is important to or an orthodox thing is, is the spirit doesn't um, isn't seen as um, existing of himself apart from the father and, and the son. Um, and so versus where when we talk about the Trinity, you can sort of like three circles, for example, um, to try to grasp <laughs> what is um what's infinite and, and, and without without limit and in a sense of physical sense but but um what i i like to do is speak about um like the father is in a sense a circle the sun is a circle that they are like two separate spaces but not in a physical sense but the, the sun it, um it, it's gotten out of from out of the father in other words he's a complete image of the father who, who is absolutely distinct from the father. So when we say he's out of the father, it's not some part of the father, it's not some internal little bit inside the father or something like that. He exists completely of himself and completely equally as the father exists. So he can't sort of fit him inside it, inside the father. But in a sense, he's in the father. But but in another way, he is not in the father. And so in a sense, it sets a separate space. And when I talk about the Holy Spirit, he doesn't exist as a third space in relation to those two. He exists in a way that is a space that covers both. So he's not either because he's not in one just in, or just in the other. He is, he is in the space of both, but he doesn't exist beyond the space of both. So, so he isn't, you don't conceive of him apart from the Father and the Son. This is also why he proceeds through the Son. It, 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 that is, there's no space between the Father and the Son. There's, so when he proceeds out of a Father, he does not just proceed into some empty space or some empty <laughs> emptiness. Right. The, the procession is through what, what else is there other than the Father um, it, it, like, is, is the Son. So procession requires the sense of the, the begetting of the Son to make any sense because it requires the, the second object for a want of a thing the second space for procession to work but the, the procession only stays within those spaces it, there's no other it's not it's a meaningless to talk about the procession going into nothingness when st john of Damascus makes this point and even um st augustine where we'll come back to that more makes this point as well um and so that, that the procession and and this is where you've got to be, a bit of a generation is something that sort of sets, sets itself up over, but it's sort of in another space apart from the father, but this procession, its distinction is it doesn't set itself as another generation in another space. It stays within the spaces of the other two, but it's common to both. And so I think this is quite um, an important conceptual way of understanding, whereas for, from my understanding, the filioque requires a spirit to almost exist in another space um, of itself being derived from the two and so i think this is a way of conceptualizing the difference between um orthodox perspective and the and the, um, roman catholics perspective at, at, at one point so um yeah anyway <laughs> yeah no that's good that's very helpful because um often our minds are just we're 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 locked and chained to the time space continuum so our mind thinks in these spatial categories ma making material distinctions between separate things and so when we describe the trinity we can often merge into that kind of thinking um but that clarification there helps okay so we're going to move on from the second part to the third part which is um the theological explanation of the doctrine of the filioque and i'm going to go ahead and give that and then after that um father uh, Father Patrick will respond to that, and we can talk about, we can go back and forth on uh, what we think about this, okay? So the, the, so the Holy Spirit in Catholic theology, um, we say it's, it, it, how's my audio? My audio is good? Okay, good. Uh, the Holy Spirit um, in Scripture is presented as the Spirit of both the Father and the Son. And this doesn't prove the filioque by any means, but it shows that the Spirit relates to both Father and the Son in two distinct ways in which the Father and Son cannot reciprocate or oppose in equal format. So in other words, there is no Son of the Spirit, um, and we would say that there's no Father of the Spirit because 
if the if the if the father of the spirit in that sense in that strict sense would mean that the the spirit would be a child or a son um so the the spirit has this unique relationship with the father and the son uh such that it's the spirit of the son and we could say the spirit of the father that's just a that's just a uh, an intro no proof or filioque or anything like that the other thing we would say as Catholics is that the what's called the economic trinity reflects the theological trinity. And so that what that means for the listeners is that in the Bible, the Son is presented as someone who is sent by the Father, and the Spirit is presented as someone who is sent into the world from the Father and the son or from the father and through the son and um this in catholic thinking and and it kind of has ancient precedent in uh the thoughts of uh, ambrose and augustine this shows that the that there's a sender and then there's the one sent okay now it doesn't it doesn't mean it, 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 what Father Patrick was just describing also applies here, where it's not as if the spirit gets sent and then the spirit goes away from the father and the son and the father and the son are kind of in the background and the spirit goes and he acts independently of the father and the son. These things are shared equally in, in, in its activity and power and will and in all things. Um, so the procession of the Holy Spirit in time, it, you know, it's not really, it, it, it's our experience of God, but it does have, uh, you you do have a, a, you know, a unique aspect of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we would say that the temporal signification that the New Testament gives to the Son being sent by the Father and the Spirit being sent by the Father and the Son reflects the timeless relationship within the Trinity. And you get, I get this from Augustine in his De Trinitate, uh, book 4, chapter 20, where he says that the Son being sent by the Father uh, shows that he was begotten of the Father outside of time. And the, the Holy Spirit being sent or proceeding from the Father and the Son in time shows that he proceeds from the Father and the Son outside of time. And that so this is where, uh, you know, one of the things that Catholics would look at as a piece to the puzzle um, in, on this issue of filioque doctrine. Okay, so that's the, that's the second thing. The third thing I would say is that there's a specific passage in Scripture which uh, it's, it certainly seems to um, open the doors to a filioquist construction of the Godhead. And, and I'll cite that Scripture reference here. It comes from John 16, verse 13 to 14. I'll read it. Jesus said to his disciples, When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Close quote. Although this passage is speaking about the spirits coming into the world through Christ to illuminate and reveal the truth to the disciples, there are some elements of Jesus' teaching here that inform us of a theology which I think logically results in the filioque doctrine. First, the spirit does not speak of his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. This puts the Holy Spirit in a receptive hearing position. This implies hearing to receive and to receive knowledge. Right? Yeah, that's, what, that's what's being implied. But how can the infinite God be in a receptive hearing position to gain knowledge? The question should be glaring. 
God knows all things eternally, and this is because he's he's actus putus in the Catholic theology. He's he's eternal. He cannot have a give and take of information and knowledge. So it would help if we understood that Christ said something similar to about himself. So in John 5, 19, he, uh, this is Christ speaking, the Son speaking. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he, the Father does, the Son does in like manner. So there's this is it opens up this idea where the Son is sort of in a like a receptive Im imitation role of the Father. In John 8, 26, Christ says, the Son says, He who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. So it's John 8, 26. So Jesus is, is saying that he's also in a receptive hearing position from the Father, hearing to receive knowledge, uh, presumably. Um. Some interpreters might get away with trying to say that Jesus can say this because he has a finite human nature, capable of fresh receptivity of knowledge and information. However, we cannot say that about the Holy Spirit, who was never given human nature to his, to his hypostasis. This can only make sense, therefore, that the Son is in a receptive hearing position and the Spirit is in a receptive hearing position. If we understand that this receiving knowledge from the Son by the Spirit intersects with his receiving his divine essence from the Son, because receiving knowledge is receiving what pertains to God's essence, because knowledge and to be in God are equal. This is this is how we would see things in in uh, from a from a, a viewpoint of the divine infinitude and the divine simplicity of God. So it would correspond to the Son's receiving knowledge from the Father as intersecting with the reality of the Son being born of the Father and thereby receiving the divine essence from the Father. In other words, this receptive hearing position through which the Son and the Spirit receive knowledge from the Father um, is a reference to their eternal and hypostatic origins. Now, if that's the case, then the filioque way seems logically resultant since the spirit would be hypostatically originating from the son, i.e. receiving his nature and his subsistence. Now, this argument is particularly interesting because Photius of Constantinople had argued in the 21st chapter of his mystagogy on the Holy Spirit on this particular passage in John 16, 13 to 14. And he said, he argued that if we interpret, he will receive from me, he will take of mine, or he will take of what is mine. If we, Photius argued that if we took that to mean that the Holy Spirit actually takes knowledge from the Son, then that would result in the filioque doctrine which is one of the reasons why he said we cannot interpret John 16 in that way. So um, he he it was it was important for him to understand that take, uh, Christ saying he will take of mine is talking about taking from the, that he will take from the Father alone. So sola uh, ex patre solo from the Father alone. So um, that's important because. There are eminent church fathers who interpret John 16, verse 13 to 14, um, in the way that I've described. And um, for those of you who have my second edition of the Filioque Way, um, I cite from Ambrose on page 68, Hilary of Poitiers on page 71, Augustine on page 63, Cyril of Alexandria on page 64, to 65 and 70, and Athanasius on page 67. And in those 
we don't have time. I can't go through all those verses. There's the citations here, but um, those citations, you know, um, they they speak of Christ saying that the Son will receive from the Spirit in this way. So that's that. I think that's the scriptural uh, argument for the filioque. Way. Now, the metaphysical, philosophical articulation of the filioque. Way, was famously given by the English theologian Anselm of Canterbury, but it was further developed by St. Thomas Aquinas. And it, it is his presentation that I would give here, and I'm just going to give the preeminent argument that, that Aquinas gives. So that way we're only working with one argument. Father Patrick only has to uh, look at one thing. It's the chief argument, so that's what we'll take a look at. Um, following the faith of Israel, Christians believe that the God who made the heavens and the earth is one God forever and ever. Amen. And yet Christians have also confessed God in three persons, the blessed Trinity. How can there be three persons who are altogether one single God? The first hint given in Christian theology of the triadic distinction within God is by their names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These names are marks of origin and procession going forth from. The, the name Son signifies that he has a father from which he was born. The name Spirit, coming from the Hebrew Rua or the Greek Pneuma, signifies the breathing or spiration of the Father and the Son. This relational language signifies the presence of an origination and originated within God by way of relation. In Latin theology, we call this dynamic the principle and the term of the principle. One can also say the principle is the cause or origin, and the product is the term that comes from the principle or the cause. Now, since these processions cannot be external to God, for by that case we either assert polytheism or make the Son and Spirit creatures, we must confess that these processions within God are internal to God. However, because God is absolutely simple and his essence is perfectly one, the processions within God must be internal and only where processions follow an opposite relation. It cannot be that divine persons are distinguished from each other in any absolute manner, because then that would, just, that would multiply the divine essence. Therefore, Aquinas argued it must be that the persons or the hypostases are distinguished from each other by relations of oppos opposite relations. Now, the relations do not make distinctions unless they are opposite. So, otherwise, the father would break into two persons by way of having his relation of paternity to the son and the, the spiration towards the Holy Spirit. Therefore, relational opposition alone counts for distinction within God. All things in God, argue the scholastics and the Council of Florence, are one and equal, save for where opposite relations prevent it to be so. One can find this principle in Gregory of Nyssa, Contra Eunomius 141. He says, quote, When we have removed the thought of cause, the Holy Trinity in no single way exhibits discord with itself. Elsewhere in his work, Not Three Gods, to Ablabius, he says, quote, that while we confess the invariable character of the nature, meaning no difference, we do not deny the difference in respect of cause and that which is caused by which alone we apprehend that one person is distinguished from another, close quote. One can also find this in Basil, Contra Eunomius 2.28, where he says that in the shared essence of the Trinity, no distinction is found anywhere unless there is an opposition or antithesis. Aquinas then argues that if a person is, dis that if each of the divine persons are distinguished from each other by relational opposition and not merely by way of relation, by just relation by itself, then the Spirit's procession from the Father and the Son's generation from the Father would not sufficiently oppose the Son and the Spirit. This is also seen by how the Father's dual relation of active spiration and active generation don't break the Father into two, 
because those relations don't oppose each other. And so they're safe to merge into one. Therefore, relations merge into unity where there is no opposition. Furthermore, Aquinas argues that since there cannot be in God opposite relations, except, as Gregory of Nyssa said, by way of relations of origin, then either the Son causes the Spirit, I mean, either the Spirit causes the Son, which nobody holds, or the Son causes the Spirit, the latter is admitted by the scriptural argument that I gave and is further testified by the church fathers. Lastly, last point, because the son himself is born of the father, then the ultimate origin of communicating the divine essence does not find its locus in the son, but in the father alone. Therefore, the father, excuse me, Therefore, the Father retains the non-communical property of being the ultimate cause, haitia or arche, of all deity. And out, and out of him comes the Spirit by way of the Son. In this way, the singular monarchy of the Father and the filioquist resolution for a distinction between Son and Spirit are coherent and orthodox. So that's my segment there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have Father Patrick um, highlight some points that may be, uh, uh, you know, might be a, uh, an issue of disagreement and see perhaps if we could resolve those and then, uh, and then we'll take it from there. So Father Patrick, if you could turn your audio back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, it's quite a bit. <laughs> there to go to go through um so i will try to yeah if you if you i mean i i have a lot of time i don't i know if you don't have a lot of time we could always no do no, a, no it's fine i've got time part. as well so it's, uh, don't feel limited in any way yeah okay no it's all right i'm just getting my own little bits of notes and things together in front of me here so um right yeah where to begin <laughs> Um, the first thing is the passage of, now this is, this is probably a, a, a very interesting and one of the more challenging points, I suppose, is how we read this passage about Christ speaking about the spirit receiving from what is mine. Um, now what must be stated is that when it, the passage is receiving from what is mine, not receiving from me but it received from what is mine. Now, some fathers, St. John Chrysostom, for example, re re treat that very carefully, and he speaks of it as what is mine. So other fathers have uh, taken that in the more, as a sense that Eric has expressed, of receiving from me. And you do see that in the fathers. And that does have an impact uh, on the way of understanding the, the relationship within the, father, the, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, taking it in what it literally says is receiving from what is mine. Well, whatever the father's is, is the son's. So what is his is what the father has. So if the spirit receives his essence and being from the father, he's receiving from what is the son's, because of this, whatever is the father's is the son's. So this is, a, the, so in the strict sense of what is mine, we can read that it's, just, it's completely and utterly compatible with a spirit proceeding just from the Father. Because the spirit takes all that is from the Father himself, and that is what is the Son's. So in a sense, we could even say he's taking from the Son. Because what the Father has is the Son's. If that's what the Son is, it's he's taking from the Son. He's receiving from the Son, because what the Father has is the Son's. So in this sense, the Orthodox can speak of this without going that he proceeds from the Son, he's caused by the Son. Because from taking what is the, the, from the Father, he is taking from what is the Son's, he is, in a sense, receiving from the Son. And yet, he only proceeds and is only caused by the Father. So that's the way of dealing with that text. Now, as I say, some fathers are, are taking that into a slightly more filial manner, but not necessarily so. Um, and this is one of the issues with something like St. Um, 
Ambrose and St. Hilary, who are actually very careful to distinguish between the procession of a spirit, which I always refer to the Father alone, and the sending, which I send to Father and Son. Even though they might talk about this re receiving from the Son, as St. Ambrose does in that bit, the, um, they are very careful, uh, as distinct from St. Augustine, who, who does make a much more clear sort of statement of proceeding from the Father and the Son. Um, so the Amorites do not do that. And so you, you really are interpret. So they are actually quite a lot closer to the Eastern perspective, which uh, it sees procession only from the Father. Um, though you can read them if you wish in the, in the um, filioque way. I'm not saying that it's impossible to do so or even unreasonable to do so. But if you look at them carefully, they're not actually teaching the filioque way as Florence teaches um, and they can be read quite adequately not saying that um, because I had, uh, you can see them as they're quite careful in the way they word things you know, that, that is consistent with the since it's like St. Basil the Greek and St. Gregory of Nyssa. Now um, talk about St. Gregory of Nyssa for now um, the quote about cause now this is quite an important one but if you read to law on a little bit Further, St. Gregory of Nyssa actually only talks about one cause and one effect. He talks about the one cause being the Father, and from that you have uh, what has caused. Then he just so, and then he makes us talk about the, the cause being, but then he starts saying, well, in the effect, we actually have another distinction. And one, and then, but he doesn't talk about one, the second part is caused by the first part and, 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 and by the son, the second, the, the, there's another causal relationship. He doesn't even raise up another causal relationship. He talks about the distinction relative to the cause. So one is immediately from, directly from the cause, the son, and the spirit is, uh, in a sense, mediated through this, through the son, through the son. So in other words, just saying through the son. Is that the, the, the manner of existence of the spirit is through the son, as distinct from directly in relationship to the father as the son. But he then also goes on to carefully say that the, that does not, the through the son, does not re deny the, um, the origin of the, the spirit as uh, of his being, the relationship of, of the spirit according to his essence, what he is, being the father. In other words, he's saying the father is actually the cause. The through is not a causal step. It, the through is, is a, a, a pertains to a manner of existence, but it's not interfering with the cause being the father. So he's actually going on and saying, no, it is not another causal step. The, the spirit is caused by the father. His origin everything from the father, and but it's through. But we understand the manner of existence as through the son, as as distinct from this directly from the father. So I think you've got to read St. Gregory quite carefully here. And it's easy to, to jump on the, the being causal, but if you read him carefully, he's actually not saying that. He's, he's sticking to the Eastern position on the matter. Um, the next one of interest and just sort of uh, something I've picked up is I'll just pick up some, some, um, some Augustine here. And it's chapter 15 of his um, fifth book on the... the um, on the Trinity, and he says, but it is asked further whether as a son by being born has not only this, that he is the son, but he that he is absolutely, and also and so also the Holy Spirit has been given, is not only this, that he is given, but he is absolutely. So this is tying back in with Eric, what Eric was saying about the sense of the Spirit being sent by the Father and the Son and being something given. How does that tie back into the um, eternal existence of the Trinity? Um, whether, therefore, he was before he was given, but was not yet a gift, or whether, for the very reason that God was about to give him, he was already a gift, also before he was given. But if he does not proceed unless he is given, and assuredly could not proceed uh, before there was one to whom he might be given. So in other words, this is quite important, this little bit here. That St. Augustine recognizes there is no procession, actual procession, without a recept someone to receive. The procession requires a giver and a one to receive. 
So he, um, the, his, how in the case was he absolute in his very substance if he is not in this because he is given? Just as a son by being born not only has this, that his son, which is said relatively, but his very substance absolutely, so that he is. Does the Holy Spirit proceed always and proceed not in time, but from eternity? But because he so proceeded that he was capable of being given, was already a gift even before there's one to whom he might be given. For there is a difference between the meaning of gift and the thing that is given. For a gift may exist before it is given, but it cannot be called a thing that is given unless it has been given. So he's, he's, he's raising up this interesting little um, conundrum here as well, how we speak of a spirit as gift, and yet he's not yet given. Um, and he says, well, you can have a gift that is not yet given. Um, and you could say, that, and I, and I think that you, it could be an argument against that. And I say, well, hold on a minute. As he raises earlier that, that uh, to become to be given, but that has the problem of assuming that there could be a creation. Creation has some sort of necessity of becoming into being, whereas we confirm that the creation did not have to be. It couldn't, we could have had no creation. So we can't sort of talk about the spirit as gift uh, in relation to a potential creation in an absolute sense. That's just one little way. But in another way, perhaps we can say, because even the, just the fact that he could be given a gift to a potential creation remains the fact that he is, therefore, a gift. Um, but it is interesting, he talks about the procession requiring a receiver to be actually given. And it all, an orthodox response to that is that St. Augustine. Why are you thinking worried about this? Because what well, we have the Father, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and rests in the Son. In other words, the origin of the Holy Spirit is the Father and rests in the Son. In the sense, the Son receives the Spirit. Now, Augustine is quite correct that in the economy, the Spirit does not proceed from the Father through the Son, then gets received by the Son, then bounces onto us. The Spirit is eternally the Son's. And so in economy, he is quite right. that The spirit proceeds from both the father and son as, as from one origin to us because uh, we don't perceive him as sort of bouncing from one to the other. Uh, we, we receive immediately as proceeding from the father through the son and to us receiving the spirit. So that way he's quite correct in the economy. But this does not need to go back to having a dual procession in the, in the eternal sense. As long as we see the God, the Son as the mediator through the through the, the Spirit proceeds through the Son, that's a mediator role. And the other important distinction which we need to make is that when the Spirit comes to us through the Son, it's only coming to us, not as being just going out to the world in sort of random directions, but to those. It, there are putting aside the exception at the very start of the uh, in Acts, it comes to those who are baptized into, into the church. We first be baptized and then we, we, we receive the spirit through um, chrismation or confirmation, whichever way we want to talk about it at that moment. But it's done secondary. Now, putting aside that, that, that it's, there is an exception in Acts, this means well, the point of this is that. We are not receiving the Spirit apart from the Son. We are receiving the Spirit as being united to the Son. So the Spirit rests on us because we are sons of generated sons of God. We are united with the Son. Therefore, we receive the Spirit. And this even in Acts, the, the, the people who receive the Spirit confessed the faith of Christ. They, in a sense, become united in faith. And the Spirit resting on them, uh, uh, that reminded they needed to therefore be baptized. They couldn't be not baptized. That's why Peter Midget goes, we must not forbid baptism to them because they were recognized as being able to be sons of God. This was to affirm that the Gentiles could receive, become sons of God. They could should be received a baptism, that they could be joined to the church. The church is no longer bound to the nation of Israel in a heretical, um, no, not heretical, <laughs> inherited um, sense. Uh, through physical inheritance of being born into it, it was now through baptism. And so this is an affirmation. But the point is that the Spirit is rest comes upon us because we are united to the Son. 
And so we are sons of God and he's part of the generation of sons of God and he rests on us as sons of God. So it is not proceeding from the son. It is proceeding and resting in the son. We receive a spirit from the son only in by becoming united to the son, becoming one with the son. Then we receive a spirit as the son because we didn't have it before. We have to receive it. Uh, and, but it's only in the context of the union of the Son. And this is why the, uh, the fathers talk about there's no spirit outside the church, outside the body of Christ. There is no Holy Spirit because uh, the spirit does not rest in anything other than the Son. It doesn't just go wandering off from the Father, Son, and out into everything and rests on everything. It only rests on the Son, as St. John of Damascus says, it proceeds from the Father and rests in the Son. And so it rests in the church. And this is why only within the church do we, uh, do we receive the spirit. And uh, the Spirit works miracles of, 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 the, of the Eucharist and stuff like that. Because it rests in the Son, the Son, the church being the body of Christ, the body of the Son. Um, it rests in that. And if we do not have the Spirit, we're not Christ because the Son is irreducibly united to the Spirit. They, they're companions. They go one to the other. The Spirit proceeds and rests in the Son. He doesn't go off into his own space anywhere else. So that the two are intimately connected. If you if you have a spirit, you're in the church, and if you don't have a spirit, you're, you're outside. You're, if you're the sons, if you're a son, you have a spirit. If you uh, and so that, there's a, this is why there's an intimate connection between. And so this this economy works extreme perfectly adequately in the orthodox sense. It actually works better because it actually fits the economy in a wider sense. Um, whereas if you're talking about proceeding outside, well, hold on, there's a spirit, therefore proceed from the church as well and go out and, and rest upon all the nations uh, as apart from the church. And no one teaches this sort of doctrine as far as I know, well, except I know some Pentecostals might want to start teaching this at the stage of spirit and the spirit sort of goes out into all the peoples around and they somehow separate this the spirit from the, the sun. And by the way, when I'm talking about separation here, um, we are talking about not the spatial, the father, son, horse, but each and uh, omnipresent in every every single space, but we're talking about in a sense of an identity. Well, as I talk about at the start, there's a space. The Father has a space. The Son has a space. As a epistasis, um, and we, when we have a church, we're talking about those united to the epistasis. It's an identification of the the faithful with Christ. We are in Christ. We are baptized into Him. We're into the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are the take of his body and his blood. We are one with um, the Son. And so we have an identification with the epistasis, the manner of existence of the Son. We are born again. We are sons of God because we are begotten of a Father. That's why in baptism, the Father himself becomes our Father. That's why we call our Father. And this is not an identity. This is an identity that has to be built through the mysteries, through the baptism, etc., through faith, through, through virtues, where we can call God our Father. That's not true for the nations who are cut off from that and therefore they're cut off from the from the spirit in the sense of identification as sons of God, even though the spirit, in a sense, is through all creation, working on sustaining all, all things as, in a sense, everything, all living creatures are in the image of God and therefore, in a sense, in Christ to a degree. But we're talking about a, a, a level of unity which is without division. It has been one mind, one heart. Where those who've separated through body or faith or, or sin, or etc., are no longer one. There's a separation. They're, they're not really sons of God anymore. Only in a, in a very um, the, just the basic sense of it being in the image of God. Um, so we just talk about different levels. But anyway, <laughs> just to, to clarify that uh, we're not speaking of a spirit sort of not being there in an omnipresent way, but we're talking about the, the relation to spirit as proper to sons of God the justification of his presence and his gifts to help us to transcend, to become righteous and stuff, because we're no longer separated from the sun. We're not, there's no boundary between us and, and God and participating in the existence of God. Therefore, we are just justified to um, bring us to full sanctification, to full righteousness and holiness. Whereas those in the world who are separated from God through sin, through through lack of being a different body um, that, that has not been a part of the church um, or from a lack of different faith. They can't, there's no justification to bring them into the fullness of theosis because they are separated. They're, they're, their mind and heart is, is opposed to the union of God. So the Holy Spirit is not justified in identifying them as sons of God and bringing them because they, they were opposed to him. 
And so he doesn't in there because of the opposition through faith or um, sin or whatever. So he works within those who are in the mind and heart willing to receive him into fullness of union. Therefore, he's justified and giving them life and all the rest of it. Where those in the world put fully to death. But anyway, that is an orthodox sense of that. So we, that's how we read that. And we say to St. Augustine, sort of like, you've actually raised the issue there, <laughs> but you've just sort of gone down it. You've taken the, the, the giving bit a little bit too far and, and, and then applied it back in a way which wasn't necessary. And a lot of what he says is good and, and, and accurate if we take it in an economy sense. And, but when you go too far to where you go to Florence, we would say, no, no, you've gone too far. And you've possibly even taken St. Augustine, if you pressed him on the point with Focius, that he may have actually come to Focius's position going, actually, yes, I may be going a little bit too far on this. But then after St. Augustine, the West sort of takes him pretty verbatim, and especially by the time you get to Franks and stuff, when the Filio Crave gets into the creed um, and his doctrines and his way of thinking, not being untempered by the Eastern fathers, becomes a standard norm. And um, but even it's not really, in, it's only about the late, yeah, ninth century, but I mean, that's when some photos starts complaining. <laughs> that the West really clearly starts teaching a sort of a dual procession as distinct from things that are sort of like that, but you can't quite separate them out from being um, economy or just identifying the sun, the spirit as one who from the father and the sun as identifier, but not necessarily stating in an explicit doctrinal sense that he has a substance and stuff as per Florence. Some of the Western fathers, and this is what St. Maximus does. He, he says, Yeah, they do that, but by not really meaning that he has a substance and um, being from the from the sun. Well, they're just talking about it in an economic sense or some other acceptable way, but not as Florence. So St. Maximus is saying they're not saying Florence. By the time you get to Florence, they're saying the Greeks are saying what we are saying <laughs> in opposition to what actually Maximus was, was saying. So when I read the Western Fathers, there's, there's lots of people that are moving towards Philia. Okay, this is why I find the um, proof texting very difficult because until you actually put them against Phocius and actually raise the issue and start saying, we are starting to define this eternal doctrine of procession from the Father and Son, as Eric, uh, you know, as, as it's defined at Florence, it's very hard to say, did they really mean that? We were actually teaching their filio quay. So St. Augustine is closest to that. But again, you could start arguing, well, did he really mean what Florence meant? Um, and you can definitely take him to mean that. Um, and you can step there and say, well, okay, look, he's saying this, we're justified in that. that fair enough. I, I can't. But, but at the same time, I can also say, has he, has he, when he was saying what he said, was he tested against the objections of someone like Symphotius, et cetera? And um, no, he wasn't. And so we can't take him as being an absolute single minded way of, of being the filio quay, nor the other Western fathers who follow, either follow him or speak in a way which, like the reception way, which can be interpreted filio quay. But when pushed against the St. Basil's, the St. Gregory of Nisa, um, St. John of Damascus, who's very clear that the spirit does not proceed from the father. And um, and someone like Aquinas was having to try to work out how that to, to justify that, because that was one of the objections raised at, at, at his time, is it's because St. St. John of Damascus is very clear about this. And so we must remember St. John from the Eastern perspective, St. John is a sort of a synthesis of all the fathers that have gone before. He basically, he is the best father sort of laying out the exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. He brings it all together and, and his work is very important. That's why Aquinas was <laughs> followed taking it. And it basically does lay things out. And so when he, when I was reading those quotes for him, that really is what the Orthodox believe and, and their position. And so to, to start challenging that or contradicting that it really raises some questions. Um, so that's sort of dealt with the economy. Then there's the whole issue of origin, et cetera. Um, I've touched on a little bit of that, you know, relations, op opposition relation. And this is why I speak about and just quoted St. John again about manners of existence. And, and so what we need, we talk about is three different manners of existence. So the father is cause, 
the son is begotten. His manner is one begotten from out of a father for all ages. He, but he is the only begotten. That his manner of existence is one only begotten. Then the spirit proceeds. And we say that procession from the father. And we say procession is not the same as begetting. And, and by saying that, we're saying there's a different manner of existence. It is not a begotten manner of existence. How we distinguish the two, we don't know. But they, but they, but they are different manners of existence. That's it. We just said that, and that that means that there are three different manners of existence. However, we can um, go a little bit further with procession and say the far, the son when we define begetting is begotten out of from out of the father. That basically covers it. He is the essence, it's a God of God, true light of true light, begotten, not made through um, all, all these things. But basically, that basically defines begetting is just say, he's a father, he makes it he's an image of himself. Um, that's pretty clear. Right? But procession is, you can't just only, oh, he's a father, and the spirit proceeds from him. That doesn't quite cover procession enough because procession actually, as, as, um, St. Augustine says, receives a receiver. What is this position? He doesn't, and basically, he doesn't proceed into nothing. He doesn't, doesn't flow out of a father into nothing. That, that, that's me. There's no nothing outside of God. There's just the father. And the only other thing for any procession to make sense is the son. And so for any procession to make sense as procession and, 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 and language and human language, it implies that there is a giver and a receiver, and the only possible givers and receivers eternally is a father and the son, and that's what the orthodox doctrine is. He proceeds from the father, rests in the rests in the son. Um, it's a terminus of the procession, and so the procession does require mention of a father and the son. It has a start point and an end point. That's what rest means. It means the termination, the, the end of a procession. The father, the origin, the rest means that the, the procession ends in the sun um, and, the, and it's finished. And so when we define a procession, we need to take into account father and son. And this is why it comes third. And it is distinct because it, it, it is a, a man of existence requires the mention of the son through the son. Um, it, it, it cannot just be pop out of the father of itself. It has to come proceed through the son. And to rest in the sun because it doesn't go beyond the sun. There's nothing to go beyond the sun. So this is why we talk about spaces. We're talking about what we're talking about is two epistases. So, so when we talk about spiritual, so that's how we distinguish them. The other three are quite different. We don't have to talk about the, the origins being um, different. We just talk about the way that the, these are des described as different. So we don't talk about the sun being through the, the spirit. That's not necessary because the generation doesn't require that. But procession does, and that's how we distinguish the two words, and that's why we say through and resting on as different manners of existence. And so, there's no need to talk about, well, we do need to talk about causes from the father because the generation has to have a cause, and the procession has to have an origin that is a father. Um, and then going on to, if, if I may, <laughs> um, uh, do you want to interject for a moment, um, Eric, or can I go on to another point? or? Yeah, no, go on, uh, make one more point, and then I was going to uh, share my screen to look at uh, Gregory of Nyssa just to take a quick look. But, yeah, go ahead and make your, your point. Yeah, and so um, what well, you do just get my head back in the <laughs> of the of a point. Um, yeah, the other thing about father, we talk about the monarchy of the father, um, and this is important at, at a number of levels. So not only is the father the sort of the final font of all uh, things, he is the direct prototype of the um, son and the spirit. Now, what I mean, this is why I quoted that bit about God was uh, one God and his word and his spirit. The word is existence is completely in reference to the one God. In other words, the father. In other words, the son is what the father is. The the, the is exact, and then the scripture talks about the exact representative of his epistasis. It's not talking about being the father's as the epistatic property of a father, the the manner of existence of a father. But it, but whatever the father is, in other words, whatever God is, the son is there. But the but the model of the the son is the father, and that's because the father knows himself. So the son is father knowing himself 
And so that is a father. <laughs> in a sense, a son is a father because he's the image of the father. He's what the father is. Um, that's why he's absolutely the same as the father. But he exists in another manner of existence. So he's not the father. He is not, he's not the one looking. He is the, he's the thing being looked at, <laughs> an image of the thing being looked at. Um, and this is also important about the spirit. The spirit is also takes its reference from the father as, uh, and as the father. And the, the uh, model, again, to understand this, is that the spirit is a sense. The, the cause of son, that, uh, we have a little interesting uh, metaphysical problem. The son is begotten out of the father. How can the son be in the father and out of the father simultaneously? If, he's in the, if we talk about the common essence, then the, how do we make the distinction without blurring the two? If we're talking about the distinction, how do we unite the two without blurring the distinction? And this is just simply the two. You can't do that because, because the distinct part has to be completely distinct and the, and the, the one part, same part has to be exactly the same. And, not, and in that, what's the same? You, 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 you're caused to either merge them or, or break them apart. And this is why you need the third um, epistasis, which proceeds from one onto the other. It, it's a father in a sense reaching out or holding on to the son, or it's a father, it's a son himself being begotten into the father. So the spirit is the father in the son, in the son, in the son being in the father. It is what is binding the it's both distinguishing the son from the father and binding them together. It's it's, al it's allowing the union and keeping this distinction by proceeding from one and resting to the other. It distinguishes them and being the spirit of both, it unites them. And but it, but it only makes sense if the spirit is modeled from the father, like reaching out his hands, because the father can't reach out his hands and hold the fourth into himself. He can't reach out part of his mind and stick it into it because he's simple and the son is completely himself. So the only way for a father to sense reach out and hold the son into himself is through the actual procession of another epistas, which is completely God, the complete the father, because God is completely simple. He can't have the hands and stuff and bits of them coming out. The completely himself comes out, and that completely himself going out to the rest of the son must be completely a, a new epistas, a new manner of existence. But it's the father is a prototype the origin it's a father reaching out holding on to the son it's not something the father and son together and this is why i'm talking about the, the father being the monarch it, it's that the, the, both of these is a sense uh the father is image the father is spirit um and then that but they become being distinct manners of existence from the father in their own right um but this is what, what the thing we mean about it and in the, the activity of the father we, we say that the um all that the father is, is the son is, is the, yeah, and the son, and the hearing, as Eric was mentioning about before, the son. What we're talking about here is that the, the spirit and the son and the spirit are derived um, from the father. They have nothing of themselves. And then they're what I call eternally coupled to the father. In other words, there is no, they don't come, and like a human child is, does what its parent does, if it's or the mother does, if it's in its womb, she go, goes with the mother, goes and in and out back and forth because it's got a, a space or mobility of itself. But once it's born, it, it becomes independent. It can be in a different location from the mother. It can have its own action. Where the son and the spirit never get to that stage because it's an eternal begetting, an eternal procession. So they never become independent of the cause. And so whenever the father does something, the, the son and the spirit must do it. And they have nothing of themselves because it, but everything about them is derived from the father and all their thoughts, etc. Each vote, each has it completely as if it's his own thought, um, his own will, his own, uh, his own idea. But it's derived from the father because they never end up becoming separate. And this is why there's one God because there's one activity between them. So this is why the father, the son never or it does what he hears from the father because he's derived from the father. And the spirit also only does what he hears because he's derived from the father. He has no independent action of the father because there's never a time where they become separate start, or space where they become separated from each other to do their own thing independently, even though each one is completely God in himself and in a sense completely independently God of himself. Um, but because of the, the eternal coupling of the way that they're eternally begotten and yet complete, completed begotten, the, the nothing comes from the son of himself and, and, and so too of the spirit. 
Um, so anyway, these that's what um, the eternal person has. So it's not learning anything that the spirit doesn't learn. Oh, he's eternally on <laughs> everything as a father is, 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 is in, in his in his thing. But if in the sense of creation, when you start talking about creation as a will, as a choice of God, as a, as a decision, then that it's from the father and then the son and the spirit immediately as if it's from themselves also have the same act uh, and desire and action of of creating the, the will and action of creating um and if you want to talk about god judging and it's a temporal sense on man or something then or acting in a decision in a temporal sense i'm not saying that it is but then the, the father decides to, to forgive and then the son and the spirit are immediately doing exactly the same uh, forgiving etc um and so anyway so that's a little bit more on there and i will throw it back to you. <laughs> yeah i appreciate that yeah yeah i have to listen to that again because uh, um let me see if i can get uh my screen shared here uh entire screen let's see if this works uh oof that doesn't look good All right, hold on a second here. The system stops sharing. Sorry about that, Father. I, I'm. I'm <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm. I'm. I'm still trying to get used to this stuff. When I was on, try again. Uh, try again. I might have hit the wrong button. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Share. Let's see. Share screen window. Let's see if I could share this. Let's see if that works. If you go, if you get kicked out again, just come back in. I'm not sure this is going to do that. Let me try. Let me see. Yeah, no. Okay, can, I, can, I, I kicked myself out last time. <laughs> okay, can can you see my screen? Yes, I can see. Okay, it. all right. So I just wanted to take a quick look at this. Um, this is uh, from Saint Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, ad, ad blabius not three gods and uh i just wanted to highlight what i was seeing here and then maybe we could just touch on it for a few moments yeah, yeah, it's, let's it's not let's not get, get it's too... very good text to get into uh, yeah uh, i initially saw where you saw it then i more and more reading i like it more and more but uh but it is yeah. it's a very interesting text okay and 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 i i Let's not get too carried away here. I'll just kind of give what I'm seeing. You give yeah. what you're seeing, and then we'll just we'll, we'll move on. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start from here. Okay, if, however, anyone cavils at our argument on the ground that by not admitting the difference of nature, it leads to a mixture and confusion of the persons, kind of like if if they're all, if there's so much equality in God, then you're mixing the, the different persons. Uh, so that's what he's, he's, in other words, he's, he's, um, he's answering an objection that he would have gotten from, you know, uh, probably, you know, you know, me and others that this, this idea of holding to one nature, you're, you know, what in three persons, but you're confusing the persons we shall make to such a charge, such a charge, this answer that, while we confess the invariable character of the nature, we do not deny the difference in respect of cause and that which is caused, by which alone we apprehend that one person is distinguished from another. Now, let me just pause right there and highlight that because I think this is very important because I think that an orthodox reading would work very good if it said we do not deny the difference in respect of cause and that which is caused by which alone we apprehend that one person or the father is distinguished from another but here it's saying it it, it's, it implies that each person is distinguished by this issue of caused and caused. And then he says, by our belief, that is, that one is the cause. So I just want to make it clear. Um, Gregory of Nyssa is saying here that there is, you know, when he's using the word cause, he's using one, 
one reference, okay? That one is the cause, okay? And another is of the cause, okay? And then again, in that which is of the cause, we recognize another distinction. But here's the thing. It says another distinction, but up here, he said that there's there's only one cause for distinction, and that is caused and caused. So here he's positing another distinction that has to retain the caused and caused dynamic. And then he says, for one is directly from the first cause. Now, the Greek doesn't say first cause. I want everybody to know that. Um, I'm taking from the uh, Shaft series translation. But for one is directly from the first cause. So that is the son of the son is directly from the first cause and another by that which is directly from the first cause so that the attribute of being only begotten abides without doubt in the son and the interest. But okay, so we can stop there for a second. Uh, it, it goes on. Um, but what what I would say here, this is what I'm seeing here. Okay, that. Gregory of Nyssa is admitting that there's only one there's only one element in the Trinity that makes for a distinction, and that is this principle and term or caused and caused. Um, or I could say, you know, the cause and product or principle and product, cause and caused. That is the only way that we have distinctions. But whenever you have a distinction between two, that's very easy. You've got the cause, and then you've got the the terminal or the termination in the, the you know, we call it, might call it effect, but, you know, that's not really what we want to say here. It's just the caused and the caused. But Gregory has to deal with three. And for the third one, he doesn't just say the father causes the son, and then the father causes the spirit. Okay. Um and the way that he brings in the spirit, which is third, coming from the first cause through the second, or what's directly from the first cause, it seems to me he's talking about, in each of the cases here, the unique hypostatic origin of the son and the spirit. And so in this case, it seems to me Gregory is logically getting right there where Augustine and the West um, want to emphasize that the spirit comes, we could, we could trace him back to father, to the father as the, as the first cause, as the ultimate origin, but that the son has this, he receives from the first cause to bring into being eternally the third. Okay. And, and so we retain the monarchy but we also have this directly from the first cause, which is the son, being that which, being that through which another comes. So, and it seems to me we're not dealing with like uh, knowledge of the spirit, or the spirit is manifested in this way, or or the economy like towards creatures either. This is talking about the ad intra life of God, and it seems to me like. Number one, he gives us this principle. We do not deny the difference in respective cause by which alone one person is distinguished from another. But but how is the spirit distinguished from the son is the question. And I think he answers it here. Uh, they're distinguished because there's also a sort of caused-caused relation only with this caveat that the spirit comes from one that is directly caused by the first cause, you see. So I think that there's a case for the filioque here. I don't think that there's, I don't think that um, it's irrational to read it differently. Not at all. But that's how I would read this. So Father Patrick, why don't you tell me, yeah. I'll leave it up here so that way you can kind of. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, yes. So I can see that argument. And there is a case for that. And it, and it comes down to looking at this, what we do not deny the difference with respect to cause, and you say, which is cause, by which alone we represent one person is distinguished from another. 
But then we look at the next bit. But our belief is that is one is a cause and another is of the cause. So immediately we've seen, he doesn't say two others are of the cause or on another and another is of the others are of the cause. He says one is the cause and another is, is the cause. So we, can, we could actually just take it that he's actually speaking about a type of dualism here. Really, you've got the one and the other. Um, so, so the first bit, which we alone, is, so that's just referring to the father is distinguished from the other, the son spirit thing, <laughs> which he's almost speaking about in a singular sense at the moment. Um, so because he states that there, we don't, we cannot simply start saying that the first line, therefore, necessarily has to, to apply beyond as cause to effect or cause to cause from the father to the son without um, as the son having another some sort of relation of that to the spirit. So that's a first point I'd, I'd like to just note in there and that he just goes with singular. And the second one is how do we, what do we mean by cause? Does it necessarily mean a cause effect relationship or can we speak about um, the manner in which one is caused um, from the cause. So it still relates to cause, but it's, it's, it's about the manner in which one is caused. Now, it is important to, and, and Eric rightly points this out, that the Greek is not first cause. The Greek is just simply the first. Now, the reason I mentioned that is we, to make clear we don't speak of first and second causes, that the first cause is implying a second cause here. It, it just means the first. Now, you could read it as first cause, and you could imply it as sort of first and second in a sense, but uh, the Greek is not saying first cause, it just simply says first. Um, and it's an English add-in uh, influenced by sort of uh, the uh, theological ideas that it thinks that the word cause is necessary in there, but um, it is not actually part of the Greek. Um, now, then it goes down a bit lower. It says, so that the tribute of the only begotten abides without doubt in the Son. The only begotten. Oh, so what it's saying here is that this is what I was talking about, the direct from the Father, that this somehow, the being only begotten, has to be such that we talk about the one cause and the direct effect is the only begotten, the generation of the Son. So in other words, Gregory's actually sort of almost forming a dyad here. That in the Trinity, we shouldn't be just thinking about a triad, but we also should have a dyad. We've actually got one as cause, the Father, and then you get the Son, in a sense, as a direct cause of a primary effect of that cause. And then in the, the Son, we go, oh, oh, it's not, actually, that's not just the Son. We actually, but the Son, in a sense, encompasses completely the sense of generation from the Father. So when the Father knows himself and generates his image, he the Son is the completeness of that. There can be no other generation from that. So how do we explain the Spirit? Well, the Spirit is therefore can only be considered as in a sense as proceeding through the Son. So in other words, in the relationship to the Son, so he's not breaking the dyad. And this is what I was talking about earlier about the spaces. He, he's contained within the space of the Father and the Son. And the only way this can happen is that his procession from the Father is, um, and that bit uh, Eric's highlighting, I'll come back to that in, in a second, it, it has to be such that he's not becoming like a separate space from the Son. He must be contained within the Son, in a sense, uh, coming from the Father. And in this way, it protects the Son as only begotten. And then, um, and so what it talks about is, therefore, his procession is through the Son, and it's a sort of a secondary thing. And then it says about the imposition of the Son, so the mediation of the Son, the being through the Son, while it guards his attribute of being only begotten, so in other words, it protects him as being the only begotten Son, so there's not another Son, the Spirit doesn't become another Son out on the side, does not, if we scroll down a little bit, um, it's about that you highlighted a second ago, yeah, shut out the Spirit from his relation by way of nature to Father. What does this mean by relation of nature to way of Father? Well, that is referring to him being gen, uh, proceeding from the Father, that his, he takes his substance and his epistasis from the Father. That is what it means by relationship 
a way of nature to the father, that the father is his monarch, his cause, his, his source. And so the, 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 the interposition, the, the mediation side doesn't make the son a secondary cause or, or it's actually saying that the spirit, take, his relationship to is as, as cause. And this, the mediation side doesn't stop that. What it's doing is defining the spirit's uh, procession as being contained in a sense within the, the son's begetting so that it doesn't become another son and so became in the son and proceeding through as but be proceeding through the son stops it becoming another um a son and it, it, it's a way of containing it within the two so it, it, i i would read this as not saying that there's a secondary cause here it, it's about the different manners of existence to protect the son has been only begotten and that, and that must be done through a direct sense to the cause and in the complete sense. And the other one has to be through the son. And that's, as I was saying before, the spirit it proceeds from the father and rests in the son. It has to be through the son, not into a space of itself apart from the relationship. So in other words, the spirit is actually keeping the relationship of father and son. His whole procession is to affirm and establish the relationship of a father and the son. That's why he establishes the son. That is why wherever he goes, he establishes the son as son. That's why the father is absolute father in the, in the, in the Trinity, because he, because of the primary relationship is father and son. The spirit is internal to that, of reinforcing that and preserving that and establishing that relationship. But it's not an, another relationship beyond that. Um, and so, but, it's, but, but of course, he has to be his own complete epistasis of himself because there's no sense of reaching out and relating <laughs> other than the, the, the epistasis. So, um, so that's how I understand St. Gregor of Nyssa um, speaking. So that that fits the model which I was put, put, um, saying. And then it still yeah. relates to cause, etc. But it, it actually goes back to, oh, actually, what he's actually talking about is a type of dyad here, father and son, as being the primary thing which we consider and that, that the spirit is secondary to that, and that's expressed by through the through the son as mediating the, the, the procession. So we don't end up with another son, um, which is one of the criticisms of um, some, some folk as to the idea of uh, the, the, the filioque clause uh, being, being some sort of grandson or something. It, it doesn't actually get problem, past this problem of actually causing another son um, because it, it, it's sort of beyond the fire. It's, it's, it's Sort of coming from both. Um, the other point I wanted to make here um, is that the father, there is one cause. So there's not a father doesn't have a cause of generation and a cause of producing um, or spiration. Uh, it's two separate things. Uh, there, there's a cause of, and then they can give the spiration cause to the son to also spirate. The, the, the father is by his manner of being the cause himself and it is singular it is indivisible he is the of course there is one cause and of that one cause there is two effects two causes in a sense one primarily the son and then we distinguish that from the son and the spirit um, as well so they come simultaneously from the same cause then it's the father knowing himself results in the, the, the generation of the son and the procession of the spirit. They're not two separate things. And so when you start talking about the son participating or somehow having cause of well, as a, you, you are actually dividing the, 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 um, the epistasis of the father into two, or you're starting to become of two causes uh, rather than just one cause. Um, and so that's one of the arguments that Fodius starts bringing up against the uh, the filioquies. You, 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 the, the only way this could happen is actually deny that the, the father is the one cause, and um, which is very strong in St. Gregory here. So I think actually St. Gregory, when you read him as I do, is actually better reading and it's actually quite anti-filioque. So I, I can understand why people would want to read <laughs> a filioque manner, but I actually think in a deeper sense, no, he's actually very much in line with St. Basil and, and, Father, and St. John of Damascus, the father alone is, is caused. And that's what his argument is. And very interesting, there's a sense of dyad, which, which, he's, which he's arguing here, and the protection of that. It's a protection of the son is only begotten. So, you know, that's is my... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I think there's plenty to think about there. Um, so uh, I want to share my uh, screen again to... Um, 
And this is actually good because the sec section seven, which was uh, in in the in the itinerary, was set up for a discussion on Cappadocians and Augustine, and and we're already doing that, so we're, we'll have we'll, we won't have to do that. But let me just share one more thing here. Let me see. Share screen window, uh, Augustine. Okay, yeah. I just want I just wanted to take a look at. Um, Book five of De Trinitate. This is uh, Augustine here. Um, uh, this is from a, an article on my blog here. But this is a, a statement here where um, where Augustine talks about the Holy that the that uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit uh, being a principium or a beginning. Um, of creatures, right? And so he says, and so when we say both the Father is the beginning and that the Son is the beginning, we do not speak of two beginnings, like two principles or two principia of the creature. Since both the Father and the Son together is one principia or pr principium, beginning in respect to the creature as one creator, as one God. Okay. So in the context here, the Trinitarian persons uh, in relation to creatures, they are one beginning or one principia. Now, he, then he starts to talk about the mutual relation to one another in the trinity okay if the begetter is a beginning in relation to that which he begets the father is a beginning in relation to the son because he begets him okay but whether the father is also a beginning in relation to the holy spirit since it is said he proceeds from the father is no small question okay so in the context, he's still talking about he's talking about in the ad intra relations within the Trinity after having just spent time talking about the ad extra relationship of the three divine persons um, towards creatures, where that's one principia. Okay, if you if you were to make it two principia, like one principium in the Father, one principium in the Son. Then you've got two principles, but you know, obviously, one principle of God, the three persons toward creatures. Then he talks about their mutual relations here. But then he says, um, he talks about the Holy Spirit in relation to the Father. The Father is the beginning of the Holy Spirit. He says, because if it is so, he will not only have a beginning to that thing which he begets or makes, but also to that which he gives. If, therefore, that also which is given has him for a beginning by whom it is given, since it has received from no other source that which proceeds from him, here's where I want to highlight, um, it must be admitted that the Father and the Son uh, are a beginning, um, principium, in English, it's really principia for plural, uh, it must be admitted that the Father are a beginning. Actually, no, this is principium. It's in the singular. Um, of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings, but as the Father and the Son are one God and one Creator and one Lord relative to the creature, so they are one principia, principium relatively to the Holy Spirit. Now, I just wanted to say, because the whole, in chapter 15, uh, you do you do you do get this speculative thought in Augustine about giving and receiving, but it, we we have to be careful to understand that in Augustine, when it comes to the Spirit's origin, he doesn't see the giving and the receiving as two distinct realities. He sees the whole panorama of that dynamic as one beginning and that kind of comports with what the latin west would come to say when it accepted perfilium that we could say that the holy spirit is from the father through the son 
because there's a sense in which it terminates in the sun or it terminates in himself, but through the sun, you know, but I think it's very clear logically here and in many other places in the De Trinitate of Augustine that he's comparing the singularity of principle between the three persons and creatures with the the one principle beginning of the Holy Spirit in the Father and the Son, despite the fact that he can talk about a giving and receiving dynamic. My 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 worry is, or my point here would be to say that just like Augustine would not break up two causes between the Trinity and creatures, because there's three of them, he would also not make a, a real distinction between the giving and receiving of the Holy Spirit in the dynamism that he talks about in chapter 15 of the De Trinitate. You can, yeah, so if you feel for, like you yeah, would yeah. like to say now, something about that. Now, yeah. this is where St. Augustine goes to a place which pretty much uh, sets out the basis for um, the Thilio Quay argument and, and, and things like that. And um, it's quite clear in here that this is what he's talking about. Now, and I, and I, I just basically, the only thing I can say is I think he's, he's mistaken on, on this and, and argue why. Um, I think what I'd like to say, though, first is the issue is that some of the things what he's saying is actually I agree with. So in a sense, when we are speaking about the, us receiving the spirit and the, the, from, the, from the father and the son, in a sense, we can speak about that. Um, and we can talk about that the father and the son, in a sense, of our receiving, our one beginning of, of, of the thing, because these, but actually in that particular case, we'd also say that the, say the spirit himself is, is the one beginning of that position. But we can talk about the father and the son as one beginning. And so, but, but the context is only an, our reception of the spirit, not in an eternal thing. So my issue is not some of the theological principles behind what he's saying. But the um, the application to the eternity, and now here it, it's quite clear with the logic that we can speak of a father, the son as one creator, the father, the son, horse as one creator, and therefore we can speak of a father and son as one beginning. There is a, we can do it from one place, we can move it to the other. That logic works. However, there is a problem, and uh, this is a problem with an understanding the distinction between what is creation relative to God and what is a the beginning of a son in the procession of spirit relative to God. Now, creation is an activity of God. This is common to the three. It is the common activity of God. It's a common will of God and a common activity. They create because the creation is an activity, an operation, a work of God. And so the three must do it as one because of, in all things that they do or uh, they are, do as one each does it according to his own manner of existence so then the father creates he creates through the son the son is the one mediating in the sense the creation the creation was also created into the son it's now uh, some people say for the son it's, the greek is actually into the son in other words the, the the creation the end of creation is the son he is in the sense of alpha and omega creation is so here's the image so creation finds its space is as what max says the logi of a logos the little images the little images in the image we take our form and everything in a sense or what we are from the sun as, as image and and we end in the in the sun um as it, and then we are, when we are created in the spirit who perfects it who, who, who finalizes all things who hovers over the the waters as such and and he perfects the images as little images of the sun and in, in the sun um, and that, that that's the relationship, the way sort of each has its own particular role in the, uh, according to his manner of existence in the process, but they're all creating with the one activity of creating, but, but that activity is expressed differently according to each epistemic manner of existence. However, the when it comes to the, the begetting and the, of the, uh, the sun and the procession, this is not an activity of God. This is a consequence of the epistasis of what the Father is, is epistasis, is his man of existence. 
So it's an epistatic thing. So the, the begetting is from the father because it's his epistasis, the property of his, his cause that it generates. And so it is not some, this in a sense is not something that can be shared by the son. It's not a common activity. It is the peculiar property of the father. And so when it comes to the procession of the spirit, it's also a peculiar problem of the father as cause. And this is unshareable, as I read in the other quotes, that, 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 that we do know St. John of Damascus, that we, the father is cause and the son is not cause. Um, and so only the, it can, cannot be given cause uh, because that is a property of the father. So if St. Augustine, unfortunately, is making a mistake here as he's confusing what is the common activity with what is actually a man of what is, is to be the epistasis. So it's the epistasis of the father that is caused, not some activity. It's the activity, if you want to talk about an activity of knowing himself, it's only causal in the fact that it's a father as way he exists, knowing himself is causal. So it's a father's manner of existence, which is, which is resulting in the begetting of a son and, and of the procession of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's not some act of specific activity of his that he's doing. It, it, it is that any and every activity he does ends up uh, generating the sun and, and the spirit proceeding. There's the, the whole sum of his um, activity, everything. And it's the same activity that the Father and the Spirit and the Son are doing, but they don't have a, a causal effect because that's his epistatic property. It's the way he exists as, as Father. And so this is a confusion I see which um, St. Augustine has made in, in linking these two things. And I, well, I can see the logic. And I think, sadly, he's, this is a mistake in his work. And then it's being taken in the West and, and, and may build into the filio quay. Unfortunately, by the time it was done, so there was opposition between East and West and fathers in the sense of already in politics in the church. And it wasn't done in a sense of... Um, working together and, and, and bouncing the idea off for Western um, complaints. And as I said earlier, when St. Maximus hits, hits some of this going on, he interprets it in the Eastern way um, and says, no, no, they're not talking about that. But but the trajectory was certainly on that cause, uh, on that path. And you can root it into St. Augustine. And I would just have to say that that is a mistake. And I just pull on to St. Augustine and say, he, he, when you actually read him, he's got some sort of little bit inconsistency of his own thinking and he's starting to go, um, make statements, and he, there's some problems that you can start seeing in his own thought when he's trying to struggle with dealing. So, I just think this unfortunately is another area where Augustine just wandered off um, down the wrong track, and unfortunately, therefore, influenced without yeah. the, the balancing effect of the West Eastern fathers later on the, the Western thought. So, anyway, that's yeah, how that, I, no, I I hear you. That's a fair fair presentation. You know, I um, I. Uh, Obviously, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't agree, but it's given me a lot to think about. And uh, I would also have some things to say, like uh, St. John of Damascus. I think he really does. Um, I'm not I, ha I have I'm not an avid reader of, of St. John. I've read, you know, I've gone through the passages in the the Orthodox faith. Um, but it does seem to me like it, it would be very difficult to reconcile him with the filioque. Um and uh and, and aquinas just for the just for the record like you you had touched on this a little bit but aquinas um just basically said that he disagreed with john of damascus on this issue so um there's definitely a point of contention there and i i would just um i would say that you know with regard to uh augustine you know um the, he is open to uh different glosses of interpretation um but yeah, I appreciate your explanation. I think if we can go to the next part, I don't know. Um, we, we'll try to wrap it up here shortly. But um, the next part was uh, selecting a few of the church fathers that speak of from the, uh, from the Father through the Son or from the Father and the Son. But I, I, we've covered a lot. I don't know if you had any particular fathers you wanted to to bring up here before we go to questions and answers. Uh, I, I think in that particular point, I just reinforce that um, when I was reading through your book, this is inspired by the book, I was noticing a, a little bit of, of a conflation between through the sun. You, you're, you're sort of taking statements you said through the sun and using them to support from the sun. And I, I, my point was just simply um, in the East, 
both Florence does equate the two, and I can see the logic of doing so, that if you're arguing for the filio que, the, the, the statements are through the sun in themselves uh, are understood differently in the East and they're not saying the same as from the sun and therefore cannot be used as text supporting the filio que just for that statement. And so just to make sure that that has recognised that, that in the East they are meaning two different things. They don't need to say the same thing and that therefore five is quotes that say through the sun are not supportive of a filio que as as such unless you're there's something else what they're saying as well on, on top of that but there's this thing. So that was my main point really, so yeah um so uh do you mind if i share one uh, uh one citation that i think is illustrative yeah. of this that we might be able to give one more chance for me to give my statement on how yeah. i'm reading it and then you give us your statement on how you're reading it. But let's try to keep it like really short because we, we have got a little. Uh, I had a lot of time, but we're going on two hours and then the q and I'm pretty sure we're not going to get to all these questions because we've got we've got questions in here that are titles for other lectures. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me just share my screen. Uh you might have to do a, a, a second round. Just like always, Father. We'll have to do a second part. Um, all right, let's go here to... Okay, where is my... Um, there it is. Okay. I'm not sure if you see that. Let me yeah, know if I you can see, see it. Yeah. Let me see if I could uh, get rid of this to make it just a little bit more clear. And this is a Western father, and I, I, I think this is gracious for father to allow another Western father up here because we could get St. John of Damascus up here. We can get St. Maximus the Confessor up here and, and bring up some opposing sides, which, by the way, his father brought up Maximus. I think that what I've noticed in some Orthodox contemporary Orthodox um, uh, viewpoints is they'll kind of read the entire West through the lens of Maximus, because Maximus says, well, I've, uh, you know, in a nutshell, he says, I've, I've read what the Latin fathers are saying. Um, there's a difference of language. Um, all they mean is exactly what we mean. Um, and that's been, you know, so that has been interpreted at th by some Orthodox as basically now we can go and read all of the Western fathers through the Eastern lens of economic procession of the spirit from the sun only, which I don't think that's exactly fair, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say that Maximus is not easy. It, that's not an easy cookie to, uh, to take on either, but um, let's just take a look and see how we could read St. Leo possibly in a Catholic way. And then we'll hear Father in an Orthodox way. And this would give an opportunity for how an Orthodox might reconcile what a, a Latin saint in the 5th century um, could be not teaching the Filioque, even though it looks like he's teaching the Filioque. All right. So in his 15th epistle addressed to Turibus of Asturia, uh, a Catholic and Orthodox saint, um, Leo the Great stated the following. And under the first head is shown what unholy views they hold about the divine trinity. They affirm that the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is one and the same. So this would be kind of like a Sibelianism. Like there's, there's just, they're all the same. There's no distinction between the persons. Okay? As if the same God were named now Father, now Son, and now Holy Ghost as a modalism, right? And as if he who begot were not one, he who was begotten another, and he who proceeded from both yet another, but an undivided unity must be understood spoken of under three names indeed but not as consisting of three persons okay so um just a side note on the authenticity of this letter there has been some question by i think just a, a couple of scholars that i know of 
um, on the authenticity of this letter. But it looks to me like the majority of scholars find this letter to be authentic. Um, there's other letters in Leo, one other letter in Leo where he, he kind of says the same thing. But um, so in, in my reading of this, it seems as though he's he's looking at uh, a, a heresy in um, Spain, Asturias, uh, where they're teaching modalism, that there's, you know, there is no th real distinctions between Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Those are just names of the same exact thing. And so what he does here is he illustrates for us where they are really different. And he gives us their originating properties. Um, begotten, uh, like one, uh, as if he who begot. So this is the first property, begot, which would be the, the father. Another one would be begotten, which is the, the hypostatic origination of the, of the son. And then, and he who proceeded from both. So it seems as though they're all talking about their hypostatic, you know, the, the number of the cause and then the caused. Um, so it would look like to me this would be one of those passages where filioque seems to be um, posited in the eternal hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit. And and by no none other than Leo the Great, right? So he, you know, Augustine is a uh, in Leo's day, Augustine was like a, a hero, you know. Um, but Leo is also a, pre, a significant saint, as as you know, the tome of Leo was so important at the Council of Chalcedon, and then in the reconciliation libellus of Hormizdas. So how, Father, would you read this in 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 a you know alternative way possibly or if or you might just say yeah it looks like filioque must have been remnants of augustine's you know well yeah look this is where i apply the sort of some maximus um approach um and now actually just just as a, like a side note um sometimes when i'm talking about the monarchy of the father and i said the son is the father and the spirit is the father I'm not saying it in a way of a, of, of, a, uh, of a civilian, in a sense, because I'm not saying that they are eternally, each one is, each is not each other. The way I'm saying it is, is talking about the father as a prototype, as, as understanding that, that what we talk about the son, that whatever the father is from the father, whatever is from the father. So it's a little a prototype mode. And, and in a sense, one God, in a sense, one God, in a sense that the father is sort of equating for God and the, the, the spirit. Um, but that's that's so so sometimes we gotta be very careful why you sometimes mention that is a but i'm not saying that now god and now father and there's a, no they're all eternally three so, but we must be very careful when we ever approach some of these heresies like civilianism or even arianism there's parts of them which are quite correct and you can't get too simplistic about who oh, you have suddenly been civilian it's really subtle and and in some ways orthodox doctrine is almost like that but they just go a little far and start saying things. And the key thing is like, you are now named father. And now suddenly it's sort of a temporal thing, that it's a temporary thing. That's a death that they talk about. You now say father, you now say son, um, at, at, at all different perspectives, but you're talking about the same object. Um, and there's not an eternal thing. So the, the subtlety of what you're saying is really careful um, when we're dealing with these things. You gotta, when you start the point, <laughs> you have to be really careful. There's touch phrases and touch ways of saying things, which makes it the heresy and not some other bits. <laughs> and anyway, this is also now generally in this sort of text here. This is where I would say, right, he who is begotten, well, he's begotten according to his um, divinity, but he's also begotten according to his humanity. So the begotten is an identifier of the son, and it's true of his human nature and of his. Um, is, is, is divine nature. So I'm not necessarily reading that this has to be, and it can apply, and, and you're quite right to read it and possibly read it as a um, the eternal begetting, but it can apply also to his the economy. And so when I read he who proceeds from both, I can read it as being, okay, that's an identifier of who it is. And when it comes to the identifying the spirit, well, we can talk about a proceeding from both an economy. And, oh, that's the Holy Spirit, because that's the one that we receive from, from both. So I can say what he's doing is identifying the Holy Spirit as according to his relationship to the Father, so an economy in a sense. And um, 
as who he is and so and you can just read it as, as eternal sense but i can i'm just reading it okay i can read it as as the identifier of that who is it we we're talking about the one who proceeding from the power of the sun and the economy that's a good, okay so good enough to identify him um uh, but it's not necessarily making a, a theological statement that he proceeds eternally from both. Now, also, I can say that the language of proceeding from both is introduced by Augustine, and Augustine is becoming increasingly popular by this stage. And so we're seeing this. And I would, and again, that, that becomes a habit. People start talking in that manner, but that may not mean that they've reflected on exactly what they are saying, what that particularly means. They're just using it as a common sense of identifying who the Holy Spirit is. But there's not a, he's not trying to make a statement here, as Saint Augustine is, that this is a theology of procession and we must believe this and that. And so he's not doing that. So the verses here is, is can either be just simply used as an identifier according to the economy or just simply the language because it, Saint Augustine's become very popular. He's just copying and following it, but he, he's not doing so in, in a sense at a critical meaning. And he's specifically saying, oh, I'm copying it because I really want to make a statement about the fully equate in this letter that the spirit proceeds from, from both. And that's my theological point I'm trying to put across here. No, that's not what he's doing. And so I could say, okay, I wouldn't mind to say it's the best way of writing it, but I wouldn't, couldn't take this as a proof text or, that he actually believes the filio if you put him against some um, Photius later on and discuss the matter. Do you really believe that? And what do you mean by that? And stuff like that. And, and this, as St. Maximus does, and he, he says, oh, that sort of language is just um, to be understood as non-causal uh, uh, in the ways I've just described it. So that's how I, I, I read this sort of, text and so that's me it's not a proof text yes you can use it as a as another one of the fathers you pile on for the filio but in itself i just okay yeah sure but people say like that but it's not a proof because you're not discussing the theory where st augustine is much more trying to make a theological argument for it and sure. so I'll, I'll address that whereas all the other fathers uh, I, I think St. Ambrose and St. Hurry far less than even this. They're very careful about proceeds only from the father and sent by both. So they, they're quite careful in their language. Um, even if you can read the little bits sort of that support the filio quote from it, they're much more careful. Uh, but St. Leo's definitely starting to use this language. And so you can yeah. say, look, he and said this. But I'm just going to say, well, are we sure we, he actually would mean the filio quote as Florence if put in the test a question of saying the time of St. Photius? And I would say, I can't say that from this. He's, he simply hasn't got enough there. He just simply makes a statement, which is just a sort of a common yeah. expression and an identifier. So that's fair enough. That's fair enough. It, it it does not go into too much of an explanation. That's that's a, a good observation. And uh, really, the the filioque debate is in the metaphysics. It's in the doctrine, the theological reasoning, um, which you know I think we've you know we I was able to exhale my view. Um, you were able to exhale your view. That's what I wanted to accomplish in this yes. uh, in this broadcast. All right, let's let me look at some questions and answers here, uh, or some questions here because uh, some of these are just going to be. Um, let's see here, uh, Eric. Okay, uh, can you please tell us things from there? There, the sun received the service for black something. Okay. All right. Faith. This is talking. Let's see. Okay. Um, Eric Ibarra, if everything that the Father does, Son received also, and then the Son gave to the Son, I think he meant spirit. Yeah. Did he also gave the procession? Because if yes, then the spirit can produce another hypostasis. Okay, so the, I think the, the this argument is a, is just another classic argument that if the divine essence is passed from the father to the son, and that involves the power to produce another hypostasis, then presumably um, the son giving to the Holy Spirit the divine essence would also mean that the Holy Spirit receives the power to create, or, or to not create, <laughs> to produce another divine person. And so you have like a, a never-ending ad infinitum 
production of divine persons. And it's a good objection. It's brought us in, it's one of the ancient arguments against the filioque. And, you know, I would simply say, and I'm only going to take a minute here because we, we're, we're short on time, that the father doesn't just give a power to produce another person to the son. What the father gives to the son is everything that does not form an opposite relation. So in this case, spiration, which is the active relation of the father to the spirit, um, that has no opposite, uh, oppositional relation. It has no converse relation to the, to, to the son in filiation or being generated as a son. And so because of that, the father and the son come into an identity. They come into unity on that particular action. Now, when I say action here, I don't want to make it seem like, because this is one of the things that Father Patrick brought up, and we, we would have to have a second part to talk about this, but where you've got the, 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 the manner of existing, and then you've got this action like spirating and, and, and generating as if they're like tooths, you know, like a, like a stream going that way and a stream going the other way. Um, what, I, what we're talking about here is that there's one divine nature, but there's these opposing relations. The Father relates to the Spirit by an, opposi an opposition. The Spirit comes from the Father. The Father spirates the Spirit. So you have a converse relation there, okay? The Son and the, the Father have a converse relation from fatherhood to sonship or fatherhood to paternity and filiation. Now, spiration does not factor into an opposition between father and son. And so father and son would merge into unity even though the relation is, is singular, okay, to the spirit. So in that case, it's not that the son is receiving some extra power to create another person and then the and then the son has to give that to the spirit okay what's the what the father is giving to the son is the spiration of the holy spirit the act of spiration of the holy spirit so in that case the holy spirit can't receive that because the holy spirit forms an opposite relation to that namely being passively spirated so he's on the other end of active spiration. So you've got active spiration, let's see, active spiration from the Father and the Son. And then the Holy Spirit's on the other end. He's spirating too passively. Okay. So you wouldn't then say he's acting that the Holy Spirit can actively spirate another person and then another person and another person because the Holy Spirit already terminates in an opposite relation, namely the the passive spiration. Okay. Um, Father, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. I think you're on mute. Aha, now you can hear me. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, look, I, I, I sort of follow your argument. I, um, I, I do think there is this, again, this is, is a classic argument. I, I think that for anyone in the West um, or Philia Christ supporter, your counter argument is probably going to convince them and, and they'll be satisfied with that at an intellectual level. There are other nuances of this argument which, be, which can be put, put on, but... Um, and as a such, there, we're assuming that there is only two um, types of procession from the Father. There's um, begetting and spiration. We haven't got gyration and formulation and something like this. You know, there's four different things, and then we, we'd we have to go four levels, or you can make it a, 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 So the, 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 we are assuming that there's only two. Um, and therefore, when you do the two the start, well, then there's a logic to go there. But of course, there's the other issue, of course, that why isn't the sun forgetting the spirit forgetting the, the sun as well? And that, that requires another bit of logic, but that's not that infinitum argument. So, anyway, um, otherwise, I think your explanation is pretty satisfactory on that particular point. So, all right, we have a, we have a, a question for you, Father. Um, can Father Patrick Ramsey please tell me what the unity of faith was? 
between East and West if there was a dogmatic disagreement here? How would this not be a proof of Protestantism? Um, well, the, the dogmatic um, unity of faith was established through the ecumenical councils. So you've the scriptures, you've got the Creed of Nicaea, uh, the Council of Nicaea, the Creed of Nicaea, you've got the Council of Constantinople and the, Council, and the Creed of Constantinople, which becomes a, the, the statement of faith across everywhere. Yeah, um, that was an Eastern Creed, which effectively, <laughs> but the Ecclesiastical Community Council became the dominant one, replacing the, the, the actual Creed of Nicaea, um, both saying the same thing. Um, then um, Ephesus is agreed, uh, Chalcedon is agreed, uh, the Fifth Ecumenical Council is agreed, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, the, um, the, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. The issue of the Philippi had not yet come up. Um, and so it, it was only when this sort of missionary started back, you know, meeting each other in the Balkans, when this sort of, the, and there, because of, uh, um, especially because of the, inter the iconoclasm caused a huge problem, and it's sort of started many that the Roman emperors start, the Eastern emperors started grabbing bits of what was Roman territory and stuff. And then there's missions going north from Constantinople, which crash, clashing with missions coming west from the Franks and, and to the Balkans and there's arguments. And then it started becoming aware that, um, and it's actually, though, so I'm just jumping around a bit. Toledo had made a statement of faith um, about the, that sort of was a filioque statement in it but it wasn't actually insert i don't believe it was actually inserted in the creed that was confessed at that stage it was just a statement of the council um and such but that was a local council which they hadn't got to east but when the, the, the later it's in the end of an eighth century where the um in front and francia the they added inserted the or actually rewrote uh, uh, rephrased the creed of constantinople to add the with filio quite and and rephrased it a couple of other words around around that um at that time and then that creed from the end of eighth century will start to be used in the missions in the ninth century and uh, we were meeting with the um the easterners that's when they started going oh what what are you saying so th this was actually some very new by the ninth century and then, then at that stage there was real started to be a clash. So earlier, the in the seventh century, St. Maximus had started meeting some of the phraseology were used by St. Leo, and he interpreted it in a way that was compatible to the East. And in that stage, no one was making a big trying to make a big point of it. No one was trying to insert things into a creed. They might have made a creedal state type statement, you know, statement of faith and so but it wasn't been trying to be inserted in the creed. So at that stage, it was able to be sort of under the carpet. No one really sort of made a deal of it. But what happened in, in, in the Frank, with the Franks is the way we're starting to deal with theology, the way we're starting to think about things, the, the development that was taking place in there was starting to come up with certain results, certain outcomes, which was increasingly becoming contradictory to what was happening in the East. And, and there was a number of issues. And these all sort of just started snowballing from about from that, but it's a particular way that the Franks were starting to deal with the theology, which started generating the issue, and that then it became an issue. Before that, there was nothing really to write home about. There's just some odd phrasing which they, they sort of oh okay, <laughs> and and they were all agreed in the other ecumenical councils and stuff, so everyone was was happy. Um, so it, it, it's a particular thing from a, from the end of the eighth century, early ninth century, it started generating the problem. Thank you so much, Father. Um, all right, so this question is, uh, Eric Ibarra, John Demosene, in one of the orth in on the Orthodox faith, says the Spirit doesn't proceed from the Son, but he does say the Spirit is produced by the Father through the Son. How do you reconcile? So this, is, I think, Father Patrick will be more qualified to answer this question, but I'm going to go ahead and give my private, personal shot from the hip um, and then Father Patrick can give what he, he wants to say. Um, I, I do comment on St. John of Damascus in my book, but if you read my book, the section on St. John of Damascus, I kind of show some hesitancy on taking a firm side because I just I, I, I see that I see that there's there's a couple of ways to go about it. But this is something you see similarly to like St. Therasius of Constantinople at the Council of Nicaea II, 
where he talks about he's speaking in the terms of the creed at the fa- you know the 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 we believe in one god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth then we believe in the son um who you know born of the father before all ages and then he gets down to the holy spirit who proceeds from the father through the son and you know it sounds like he's talking about the unique hypostatic originations of the persons outside of time eternally um and so it, it sounds like what saint john says in certain passages is that the holy spirit is proceeding from the father through the son and the idea is to take the ek and the dia the from the father ek um you know ek from the from the father and then dia who you from uh, uh from the uh, through the son as if those two were making up the hypostatic origination and there's a temptation for catholics to kind of go in that direction however uh we have to be open to the fact that it it doesn't say i mean uh, saint john does say that the son is not that the spirit is not from the son and so it, it, it technically we could come along with the florentine logic and say well yeah not ultimately from the son because the father is you know every all deity is traced back to the father as the source so when john of damascus says that the spirit is not from the son it's it's possible that he meant he's not from the son as if the son did not derive from the father this principle of of spirating the spirit but i I, I think there's a little bit of pain involved in that uh, on the Latin side. And I think that there's a, it's a little bit more easy breathing to take it in the Orthodox way. Um, so I'll go ahead and let Father Patrick answer. But that's what I would say about that. It's possible to read it in the Latin way, but I think it's a little difficult to do that. Yeah, look, I, I think this is the St. Augustine or the equivalent of the Orthodox side in the sense that this is the clearest sort of statement and, and, and a theological exposition on the matter and an in-depth discussion on the matter as well. It's not, not some passing statement. It is a deep exposition of the theology. And it is, yeah, it, the, the idea of not being the ultimate source of the spirit yeah, it's a bit painful to do that, but it's the same way as sometimes I can try to interpret St. Augustine in a nice way, but it's a little painful because it, <laughs> it doesn't quite fit fit nicely. So I think, the, yeah, for Roman Catholics, this is a text of all filio Christ supporters that is like, uh, we just want to bury that in the sand down here and, <laughs> and quietly just forget that it was ever stated, just as an Orthodox might look at St. Augustine. Yeah, we've said he's a massive saint, but that particular text we just quietly <laughs> bury <laughs> over, 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 over there somewhere. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I can really say is, um, yeah, it, it's a difficult text from the room, and it's one of those the key um proof text of the orthodox point of view just as st augustine is a proof text on the other side and then both fathers are recognizing both sides and so that leaves everyone in an interesting quandary <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. all right thank you so much so i think we're going to call it a wraps there and then we'll have to plan for a second time because there's so much to get into and what we could do maybe for, maybe for the second time is since we covered so much ground here we could start getting into more of like the the like the the gritty reasoning behind the filioque and the orthodox position so i'll do some homework that you've given me i gotta read saint john of damascus and uh and get more into that so thank you so much father for coming on um again listeners if if you'd like to um see see some of this more from my perspective the the, the book on the filioque is available on amazon father patrick also has an article on the filioque that he published on reason and theology i'll link that in the show notes and uh, so that way you have access to that and uh, until next time um, thank you all for watching please like subscribe share it abroad we'd like people to uh, benefit from both sides here so uh, we'll uh, we'll end the broadcast here i'll talk with you briefly after father and then we'll take it from there god bless everybody goodbye good night